Dr. Connor, thank you all uh, uh, seminar co-chairs for this opportunity to speak with you. And we'll go ahead and I'll share my screen of the presentation. Uh, we're going to have a kind of a, a two-step uh, uh, approach today. Uh, just, a, just a slight overview of uh, uh, just some introductory slides of, of what, why, why we need to, to, to measure crop atmosphere exchange and through the lens of this special facility, the Iowa Atmospheric Observatory, uh, we'll have a, uh, a virtual tour uh, through, through a video that I'll play uh, most of the way through these uh, short slides. So let's begin. Uh, and we, you know, here's a, here's a picture of our, our landscape at one of our tall tower sites. You can see kind of a, in, in this year, a transition of, of corn to soybeans and, and you know, just understanding what, what is going on with, with uh, crops and their, their exchange with the atmosphere. How, how does uh, the transport of heat and water vapor, carbon dioxide, uh, other gases, how, did, how does that influence the properties of, of the crop as well as what's going on with uh, processes related to our weather forecast. And so understanding these things both in the day and night is, is crucial to having uh, better modeling of both the, the agricultural system and the, uh, the, the weather forecast system as well. Uh, here's kind of our motivation for this tall tower study. Uh, we took several uh, surface uh, station measurements within wind farms, upwind and downwind of wind farms, and we were able to detect differences in, in both daytime and nighttime transport of heat, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. And uh, we'll get into a little bit more of those specifics uh, in, the, in the video, but this was kind of a motivation for understanding these differences that occur uh, at the surface, uh, what, what is actually occurring uh, within the turbine layer. Um, and, and so that was the impetus for these uh, tall towers being constructed. Uh, the other thing that to consider then was why we need these measurements uh, more for, for just uh, the practical aspect. Uh, surface observations are, are not really uh, telling us anything of what's, what's happening in the atmosphere in, in this uh, roughly turbine layer of 400 feet. And, and so uh, also the remotely sensed instruments that are, that are down uh, for, for measuring wind speed in the lowest uh, you know, 600, 800 feet, there's a gap. In their, in their measurement uh, response. And, and so we really need a, a tall tower to, to get a more um, uh, accurate to characterization of, of the atmospheric conditions uh, within that lowest 120 feet of the surface. Uh, so this is how we, we, we went about designing uh, the towers in, in, in placing one within the wind farm strategic uh, to get different uh, uh, looks at, at, at single turbine influences or, or the multiple effects of turbines depending on the wind direction. Uh, again, kind of related to these, these, uh, bound, these building uh, uh, CWEX experiments that were done a, a few years ago. And then uh, the, the, uh, the other tower northwest of the wind farm is kind of our control location to get that uh, natural boundary layer uh, aspect of, uh, of flow for comparison. Uh, so I can best, best say it by uh, deferring to all my team members here, uh, uh, Dr. Annie Van Lukey, Dr. Jean Tuckley, uh, Patrick Edmonds, Daryl Hertzman, Theo Hartman, and, and John Thielen. You'll all hear from them uh, in this uh, about 35 minute video. And uh, I think that will uh, be the best way to, to visualize what's going on here uh, at, at the tower site and, and how it relates to all of our our special interdis inter interdisciplinary efforts. So I'll go ahead and and uh, and change um, my my screen share uh, to to this uh, video. I'm not seeing it at the moment. Pull it up again here. Start it from the beginning and. Uh, Apologies on that. All right, minimize. We'll, we'll, we'll get it here. Um, I'm not seeing it in the background there. That's that's strange. No rush, Dr. Rieski. 
Um, I will. Hmm. Let me try again. It's not showing up. Interesting. Um, also, um, if you want to share your screen, we can also take a look at it. If you cannot find, uh, that might be an option too. After yeah, I, I just. Oh, I know what the problem is. My, my apologies. Uh, here we go. Okay. Oh, it's still not there. Well, this was working earlier. That's very, very interesting. That uh, we'll just go through it this they way, I guess. It all the time. No worries. <laughs> Everybody hear it? My name is Andy Van Luke, and I'm the principal investigator for the FANTASTIC project. Today we're going to tell you about what the FANTASTIC project acronym actually stands for, which is pretty fun uh, to say, but also pretty important to understand. Because yeah, we're doing is hearing it so far, we can't see the different properties of the atmosphere, both under natural environments, in other words, blowing around across a natural landscape, and also in modified environments like that downwind of a wind turbine, and how that affects how wind speeds and the properties and the properties of turbulence or the little eddies in the wind change over time. So at the core of the project is questions related to how atmospheric turbulence changes with height, both under kind of natural conditions and also conditions that are affected by wind turbines. We think the wind turbines might actually affect the way the atmosphere changes over time. And in general, that's one thing to know because the properties of the atmosphere actually affect lots of things. This uh, Dr. Rievsky, can you stop the video for a second, please? Yeah, yeah, I got it uh, stopped. And then uh, can you share your screen? And then it should be like the, the whole screen, not only um, oh. your files. Okay. Yeah. Now you can try opening the video. Okay. Okay. My name is Andy Van Luke, and I'm the principal investigator for the FANTASTIC project. Today we're going to tell you about what the FANTASTIC project acronym actually stands for, which is pretty fun uh, to say, but also pretty important to understand because it talks about the basic pr principles and basic properties of the atmosphere, both under natural environments, in other words, blowing around across a natural landscape, and also in modified environments like that downwind of a wind turbine, and how that affects how wind speeds and the properties and the properties of turbulence or the little eddies in the wind change over time. So at the core of the project is questions related to how atmospheric turbulence changes with height, both under kind of natural conditions and also conditions that are affected by wind turbines. We think that wind turbines might actually affect the way the atmosphere changes over time. And in general, that's an important thing to know because the properties of the atmosphere actually affect lots of things. This lower layer where the wind turbines live is actually the, 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 bar the barrier between the ground surface and the atmosphere where most of our weather happens. So understanding what's going on in that layer is really important for not only knowing what the wind speeds might be, um, but other things like how crop cropping practices like applying herbicides or pesticides might actually change uh, their, their spread or maybe how a thunderstorm might form differently under different conditions. But the basic understanding that we're trying to get to is basically a really fundamental underlying of the way the atmosphere is behaving at the, the lowest levels. Another area we're focusing on in the FANTASTIC project is to understand the transition that the wind speeds and turbulence go through when they go from day into night. I'm sure many of you have noticed that the wind speeds tend to get really high during the middle of the part of the day 
and then as the sun goes down, there's this sort of calm period around sunset. That's actually not a coincidence. It's a, it's a fundamental process that happens uh, all the time. It happens differently under different conditions. And what we want to do with the Fantastic Project is to provide some new insight into the way the atmosphere behaves, how turbulence scales over time. And we'll hear a lot more about what I mean by turbulence scaling over time and over, over, over height, and what it means for predicting uh, the, the properties of the atmosphere. While I'm the principal investigator for this project, I also it's important to mention that this project was initiated by an emeritus professor at Iowa State University, Gene Tockley, who you'll hear from a little bit later in the video. His ideas and his long career of, of work toward understanding atmospheric turbulence and its impacts on the lower boundary layer and the crops below really led up to this project. And it's been really exciting for me to learn from him and to take uh, some responsibility in making sure this project sees its way through as Gene transitioned into retirement. One of the greatest examples of thinking about how fundamental improvements of understanding of turbulence could affect, affect impact or affect things that um, maybe just more everyday people care about would be the example of the derecho, the severe storm of, with very high wind speeds that affected central Iowa and in, in through Illinois and, and basically across the uh, a wide swath of the Corn Belt in the Midwest. While the derecho actually impacted this area during the daytime, it formed at night. And the uh, wind speeds and turbulence that were in the boundary layer that preceded those conditions actually were very important for the formation of that storm. We don't know a lot about what happened and, and, and exactly the, the details that led up to it, but we think that the basic understanding that the Fantastic Project is going to lead to in terms of atmospheric structure will help down the line in terms of improving computer models and the representation of the conditions that could lead to severe storms. It's not the main focus of this project, but the understanding that we'll get should help us down the line in terms of making those sort of improvements. You'll hear a little bit more about that later on when, when we have us, uh, Dan and, and John talking about how we can translate the information we're gathering from high-speed, uh, really detailed measurements of turbulence into computer model representations and how that can actually help us predict weather better. The core objectives of this project relate to atmospheric structure and atmospheric turbulence. But beyond the core uh, aspects of the project, those core objectives, there are actually a lot of broader impacts that we're trying to leverage this work for uh, to get more use and more benefit to society. Of course, this virtual tour is an example of trying to uh, make some outreach to the, com to the uh, broader community to tell us how they can learn about the atmosphere and how that can impact their lives. But other examples that we have as well go uh, beyond atmospheric turbulence and even just using some of the infrastructure of our project to study how crops grow over time and how small variations in uh, atmospheric turbulence or even the soil properties could affect how crops grow. We're actually using the tower itself as a, as a platform for wind speed measurements, but we've actually leveraged that to take some imaging, uh, to put some imaging platforms out and make, take multiple images of crops as they grow and different uh, parts of the visible spectrum to see how fertilizer affects their growth, how, how wind speed affects their growth, and even how the soil properties of the land underneath affect their growth. And you'll hear a little bit more about that from Theo on the project. Andy mentioned Fantastic as the name of the project. What is Fantastic? The acronym stands for Forced and Natural Turbulence, allowing studies of turbulent anisotropic conditions. Well, that sounds very complex. Basically, we are measuring differences in atmospheric turbulence between forced or mechanically generated turbulence from wind turbines and wind farms and natural turbulence outside the influence of wind turbines. The Twin Tower platform allows us to study concurrent turbulent differences between the two locations. We designate our A1 tower location as the story site inside the wind farm and the A2 tower location for the Hamilton site outside the wind farm. What about anisotropic conditions? These describe the structure of turbulence and horizontal or vertical dominating orientation of how eddies change with the day to night transition. So what are these differences? Let's have a closer look. First, let's examine crop atmosphere motions during the daytime. Radiation from the sun is brought down into the crop canopy where it is used for photosynthesis. The canopy warms from this radiation and the heat flow is directed both out of the canopy to the atmosphere and into the soil below. Warm air rising from the crop displaces cool air aloft, creating an overturning of deep vertical motion. This is turbulence produced by buoyancy. If wind is occurring, a sharp change in wind speed or shear near the canopy creates horizontally oriented turbulence. Very close to the canopy, turbulence is generated at scales related to crop structure of leaves, stems, and reproductive matter. The smallest scales of turbulence are represented by this formation of friction as air comes in contact with the canopy. 
The change of these scales in turbulence from buoyancy, shear, and contact with the canopy influence how vertical fluxes of heat, water, oxygen, and carbon dioxide are modified during photosynthesis. Now let's examine crop atmosphere motions during the day to night transition. Starting in the late afternoon hours, the lowering of the sun initiates a loss of net heating of the surface. Heat flow is reversed from the atmosphere to the crop and temperature decreases just above the canopy top as compared to warmer air higher above the surface. The formation of these inversion conditions, or temperature increasing with height, leads to a collapse of turbulence in the lowest levels of the atmosphere, as vertically oriented motions from earlier daytime buoyancy and friction are suppressed by the strong temperature gradient. The loss of friction near the surface causes an imbalance of the wind high above the canopy, leading to a low altitude jet of wind speed several hundreds of meters or a few kilometers above. Horizontally oriented shear turbulence develops in these strongly stable conditions. This time of transition between day and night and in the overnight hours characterizes rapid changes in the spatial variability of turbulence duration, intensity, and anisotropy. During the first few hours before and after sunset, there is also residual buoyant turbulence high above the surface that penetrates the inversion and temporarily disrupts turbulence collapse and stabilization. Distant sources of turbulence caused by buildings, terrain, thunderstorms, and other complex wave motions also influence nighttime transport of fluxes. Additionally, daytime heat stored in the soil is released back into the canopy at night, making the interior canopy often several degrees warmer than the air slightly above the crop. These complex profiles of wind, temperature, and gaseous concentrations of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor are not easily represented during evening and nighttime conditions of crop respiration. The FANTASTIC project emphasizes this specialized measurement collection of turbulence and fluxes during the day to night transition to improve prediction of these crop energy transports. Let's hear from Gene Togley, founder of the Iowa Atmospheric Observatory, about the planning and process of setting up the tall towers and how the measurements are being used to quantify impacts from crop, atmosphere, wind energy interactions. I'm Gene Tockley. I was on the faculty here at Iowa State for 46 years in the agronomy department and recently retired. And uh, so I was uh, at the beginning of this project that uh, set up these tall towers and started these experiments in, uh, in agricultural fields um, in ma making measurements of microclimate. When the project started, we uh, had to uh, scan the landscape and look for uh, a good site. And how do we choose a site for, for towers like this? Well, we were interested in wind energy also as a, a one of the aspects. So we wanted uh, two towers, and we wanted one in a wind farm and one outside a wind farm. But we also wanted sites that were away from trees and buildings and roads and, and other obstructions so that we could get the true influence influence of the crops and not uh, uh, confounded by other factors uh, such as these obstacles that would influence the flow. So we chose flat sites that were um, uh, unobstructed by nearby uh, obstacles and so that we could measure these characteristics uh, 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 quite uh, accurately. To establish these towers, we, we looked first at the, at the landscape uh, to see where the conditions would be favorable meteorologically. But then, of course, uh, we're not on university property, so we had uh, to uh, explore uh, with uh, landowners whether they would be uh, amenable to having this kind of measurement uh, made on their, on their farms. And we were very fortunate to find uh, good cooperators, uh, uh, farmers, who land, landowners who uh, were interested in our measurement. And, and eager to work with Iowa State in, in setting up these towers. So uh, we had to establish some roads and uh, into the fields and, and uh, put up uh, these 
tall towers with anchor, uh, uh, cable anchors. Uh, so it took up some space, but the farmers were very ha uh, eager to work with us and, and have been really good cooperators over this time period. These towers enable us to look at the uh, fluxes, the, the amounts of carbon dioxide water vapor that coming into the crop uh, for that will characterize its, its uh, growth and, and uh, uh, production of seed. From our experiments so far, and, and others more need to be made under more higher density wind farms and so on, but there seems to be a, a bit of a increase in the carbon uptake by the crop uh, due to the turbines and uh, so uh, at least we're able to confirm that there is a negative there is no negative uh, that we have seen there uh, uh, there seems to be no negative influence on the crop created by the turbines there seems to be a, a slight warming uh, slight slightly warmer condition at the crop surface at night uh, uh, due to the turbines and this uh, is uh, consistent with uh, satellite light measurements that have been made from space that show that the uh, the footprint of the wind farms can actually be seen from satellites because of the fact that at night there seems to be a little warm spot uh, on the landscape and so uh, our measurements show that this this uh, warming or this higher temperature is on the order of a one degree Celsius or, or less uh, so uh, under some conditions that might be a a significant factor. We also have measured uh, and looked carefully at the uh, conditions that occur over the crop uh, during the, the day to night transition. This is an important time for uh, a lot of agricultural biophysical activities because the plant is going from uh, uptake of, of heat to uh, release of heat and we find that the turbines actually are influencing the timing uh, of that process and, and when this reversal of the exchange uh, takes place. So we don't know uh, all the significance of that but at least we can confirm that it's happening. And and another factor in this, uh, in the late afternoon, early evening uh, situation is that the turbulence in the atmosphere is collapsing near the surface, but it may not be at higher levels. And so the uh, turbulent dissipation of chemicals and heat and moisture uh, uh, change very rapidly during this time period. So uh, for instance, if uh, there's a spraying operation being planned, uh, the characteristics of the atmosphere change very rapidly th during that time and it can influence the direction and, and amount of dispersion of, of uh, chemicals that are being applied. A project like this uh, will never be successful unless you have uh, 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 dedicated people that are working uh, on the project. And so uh, the key people that have worked on this project, uh, from the start it was uh, Dan Orefsky and Samantha Purdy were uh, the uh, key people, and Russ Dorenbos helped us too. Dan, of course, was a scientist at, uh, who was uh, in his, uh, finishing up his PhD and was on a, also on a uh, postdoc position during this time period. Samantha was a student of Dr. Hornbuckles, at, who got her master's degree here and then uh, uh, became our technician on the project. Dan served as project scientist, and Sam was the one from the beginning who worked with the construction of the towers uh, at both sites. Uh, over, she was on site overseeing that and was uh, uh, responsible for getting the, the instruments on the tower, the selection of the instruments, first of all, instruments on the tower, and maintenance and, and uh, data transmission. Russ Dornbos helped us, uh, being a, uh, a farmer himself, was able to uh, uh, interact with the farmers in a way that uh, he could speak the language and and uh, understand and convey to us the uh, sensitivities and the and the concerns and views of the uh, farmers that we were working with. So it was a team that uh, worked together extremely well to make this a successful project. During the project, uh, we've had some uh, changeover in uh, the uh, uh, number of uh, the people that have been working on the project. Uh, Samantha has moved on to a, a position with the uh, USDA 
today, ARS, and we were sad to see her leave, but Pat Edmund has picked up the uh, uh, work on that, so the, the data collection and, and uh, management of the site uh, has uh, continued under his leadership, and of course Andy has uh, stepped in as in the leadership role. As Jean mentioned, several team members are needed to maintain good measurements and operation of the tall tower facility. In a moment, we'll hear from the project technician for a description of these critical components related to the tall towers. For now, let's get a better understanding of the imaging platform on the Hamilton Tall Tower. Theo Hartman is a PhD candidate in agricultural meteorology. His research focuses on interpreting crop health conditions from infrared and hyperspectral cameras mounted on the tower at 270 feet above the ground. So here at the Tall Tower with the imaging suite that we've got going on, we've got a hyperspectral push broom scanner on top of the tower as well as an infrared uh, FLIR infrared camera up there as well, taking images um, every 10 minutes or so uh, throughout the entirety of the growing season. Um, the hyperspectral push broom scanner um, has a 5 nanometer wave band in between 400 and 1,000 nanometers. So that covers basically the visible spectrum and uh, into the near infrared spectrum as well. And these um, hyperspectral images can give us ideas of spectral indices that we can reference for plant health, plant productivity, and to describe some characteristics of the crop growing underneath it. For the image analysis, we take the raw, uh, raw data from the camera and calibrate that with the uh, factory settings. And after we have those factory settings, we take a look at the image itself. And for, under, for each image, um, there's a lot of different um, experimental plots in the corn canopy. So for each plot in the corn canopy, we take a uh, spectral average of those. So we have a representative spectrum uh, from the camera for each different plot. And we're going to use these spectrums with the calibration target that's underneath the camera in every single image to make reflectances. And with these reflectances, we are going to make indices, which we can use to um, describe tank characteristics by comparing those to ground truthing measurements we're taking out in the field. The infrared camera um, takes snapshots um, every minute or so uh, while it's up there. And so from these images, we can get the canopy temperature of um, the crop underneath the cameras. And from this, you can um, estimate how uh, those crops are using water throughout the growing season. And we can incorporate that into our studies as well. With the infrared images, we're going to do roughly the same thing we're going to do with the hyperspectral images. Basically, for each image, we'll take a plot average canopy temperature. And with these ca canopy temperatures for each plot in the cornfield, we'll be able to um, tell what the temperature of that canopy is and then use those in the water relations equations um, to determine some characteristics of water usage within the crop canopy and some indices of stress, too, throughout the growing season. In the corn canopy, we have some experimental units where we have different uh, applications of nitrogen on those plots. And so in each plot, we're taking measurements of chlorophyll content, leaf area index, biomass production, and we're also measuring photosynthesis and parameters that um, are also used in photosynthesis to correlate with all of the spectral reflectances that we're taking on top of the tower. We also have um, weather station on the surface down here that gives us information about the temperature, how much precipitation we have, the wind speed, and all of that can go into data which can drive our crop models that we're using to model these crops that we're imaging um, uh, in this canopy. All of this data is hopefully going to go together so that we can, we can parameterize a crop model to run field scale measurements and field scale predictions of this field using um, parameter inputs that are derived from the imaging. So the surface met station will be, will be used to put together weather inputs that will drive the simulations of this crop canopy. The reflectance indices that were derived from um, using the ground truthing measurements and the measurements from the cameras will be put into the model as parameters for photo maximum rates of photosynthesis, for electron transport rates, um, 
for leaf area index, um, those will all be used as parameter sets in the model to run these simulations of these plots. And hopefully the idea here is we can represent the plot differences using these uh, measurements from the camera. We can use these high throughput methods of using hyperspectral uh, images of crop experiments to put into crop models to run really good and precise simulations of these um, different genotypes uh, or different uh, nitrogen trials, things like that, in different environments where we can um, change the environment in which these are grown um, to look at differences um, in climate and weather, in soils, different things like that to learn how that impacts crop productivity. One of the novel things about what we're doing out here is the fact that this uh, instrument enclosure with these cameras in it is mounted on this tower throughout the whole growing season. So uh, we're taking images every 10 minutes and that uh, equates to a lot of data, terabytes worth of data of images and infrared images that are taken from this box. And so we have to have somewhere to store that. So there's a storage up in that enclosure, but we're also communicating with the, the box to make sure, number one, the images are good, and number two, so we can pull some data down from the boxes. So run up the tower is also, we have ethernet uh, connection up there. And through those connections, I'm able to see the images from the ground with my computer set up here in this room. And also we're able to pull down data and store that um, in hard drives that we have down here on the ground. That way if anything happens to the box or the camera up there in the box, we have a storage system for the data down here too. So what about the other instruments on the tower measuring atmospheric exchange? Let's turn to facility expert Patrick Edmonds for a description of the sensors and equipment on the tall towers. I'm Patrick Edmonds. Um, I help maintain and a lot of the sites here at the tall towers along with the instruments on top of them. Uh, so currently we have instruments at multiple levels throughout the tower heights, um, starting from 5 meters, going from 10 to 20, 40, 80, and all the way up to the top of the tower at 120 meters. Around all those heights, we have various sensors that measure everything from temperature and relative humidity to wind speed and direction and even pressure. Um, those come in the form of different sensors, so we have here at the Hamilton site, there's two different types of anemometers that we use. Uh, one is a cup anemometer, and another is a sonic anemometer. Now the cool thing about sonic anemometers is that they're able to measure wind components in 3D. Measuring wind speed in 3D gives us a little more of an idea of exactly you know, how the components are changing over time and you know, give us a higher resolution um, of data. So for example, the 3D anemometers measure 20 data points a second, whereas the rest of our instruments are only outputting one measurement every second. So from the sonic anemometers, we're able to measure 3D components to the wind, which lets us calculate fluxes and turbulence. So some people might notice we have multiple sensors, or multiple of the same sensor at each level. And what we do is we add the same type of sensor so that we can get a better picture of quality of data because sometimes even the footprint of the tower itself can have influence on what those sensors are reading. So if we have multiple points reading the same level, we're able to better you know, filter out any noise or any artifacts that could be related to um, unnatural measurements. So a lot of our instruments are on beams that are focused toward the south and northwest. And this is due to the more frequently occurring prevailing winds coming from that direction, um, southerly in the summer, uh, shifting toward the northwest in the winter. And we decided to place the three uh, sonic anemometers about in between there so that we can get the best capture of wind that gets not only unaffected by the tower, um, but also because that's generally where the majority of the direction of where our wind is coming from. So we also care a lot about the crops around the sites that are located by the towers. Um, we take a lot of measurements um, and photos and we keep track of you know, the vegetative stage of corn and soybean and also when it starts to go into the reproductive stages. Those are things we like to keep track of because it helps us not only understand what's going on at the ground level, but helps us interpret our data a little better as well. We have a lot of data coming off these towers, and 
with that, we have more than hundreds of meters of cables, and there's quite a bit of organization that goes behind that. Um, you know, it all comes in and gets stored onto uh, Campbell Scientific Water here at a uh, here in this shack that we have next to the tower. So it's all housed and stored here, which then over a cellular connection gets transmitted back to uh, server and agronomy. And from there, we're able to access the data, you know, manipulate it and create figures and plots which are all available to you. Let's hear from Iowa Environmental Mesonet Systems Analyst, Daryl Hertzman, about the data stream and data products available from the tall towers. Hello, I'm Dale Hertzman with the Department of Agronomy here at Iowa State. I'm involved with the Iowa Atmospheric Observatory Tall Towers Project, and they're part of collecting the data. I operate some servers here in the Durham Center on campus here at Ames that communicate with the tall tower stations. The stations themselves will transfer via FTP up to a server every 10 or 20 minutes or so, send data up here, and then we process it into the database. The stations are always collecting data 24-7, and they are communicating back to the universe here via cell phone technology. Now, sometimes the cell phone technology might be down or some other sort of communication failures be happening. The nice part about the stations is they're always logging this information locally, and they will continue to re attempt to resend this data if there's a communications failure. Once the file is sent to us, we do processing on it. Once we have successfully processed the data and, so and securely stored it in long-term storage, we then go to the station at site and delete the files off the logger. Once the files arrive here at the campus at Iowa State University, we do some processing to them. The files themselves are in what's known as a binary format and not really useful for many people. So we process this information into a database. Once the data is in a database, it makes it much easier to do statistical operations, generate products, and produce the charts like you see on the internet uh, from the data from the site. The data that arrives to us from the stations comes in two different forms. One of it being a 20 hertz data, or an observa 20 observations every second, and another data being an observation every second. These two data sets are often very difficult for people to use just verbatim, and they want downstream products from it. So we produce statistical aggregates on either one minute, five minute, all the way up to 60 or even higher time minute time scales so that people can more easily use the data. The data interests me in a number of, of ways, since it's really unique. The unique part of the data is that that we off, it provides us temporal resolution we don't see in standard weather station data, where weather station data may be hourly or even down to one minute. Since this data is one second even finer resolution, we can sense phenomena in the atmosphere we just can't see literally with the other coarser resolution data. Now this data is, can see also higher up in the atmosphere than most anything else we have as far as commercial grade or research grade weather stations that are located near the surface. Since this station has data all the way up past 300 feet above the ground level, we're able to see things happening at nighttime we just cannot see with stations at the surface. Of course, everybody remembers the duration, the great Iowa duration, Corn Belt duration of August 10th of this year. And the tower, tall tower stations, while not taking the direct brunt of the duration, did get a good glancing blow at those big strong winds from the event. Now, of course, the duration of winds will increase with height, so having higher up sensors allows us to even capture even stronger wind speeds than what were felt to the surface. But even so, the lowest level uh, sensor on the station was able to record a 90 some mile hour gust, which is pretty spectacular for a station, that, uh, for an observation rather than close to the ground. On the website, we offer some simple screening tools that generate plots for you over time periods of your choice. These tools are meant to be a quick way to visualize very fine resolution data, but over longer periods of time, such that you can get a better handle on perhaps interesting phenomena that you want to study further. And if you're ever interested in get downloading more high resolution data from us, you can send us an email at isuiao at iastate.edu, and we can start the process to get you data in a format that you need for the time period you want and for any sort of statistical sampling you need. Tower profiles of temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, wind direction, and air pressure are available from five growing seasons to explore crop and atmosphere environmental impacts related to pesticide drift and transmission and transport of agricultural pests, pathogens, and pollutants. Oh, and by the way, did we forget the weather? These data are particularly important for developing better weather forecasts, which help reduce uncertainty in making smart, precision agricultural decisions. Masters of Student Meteorology, John Thielen, will tell us about how the tower data are applied to improve weather prediction. Hello, 
my name is John Thielen, and I'm a master's student here at Iowa State University in the meteorology department. My role on the Fantastic Project is with our modeling component, where I'm looking at incorporating some new and recently developed ideas and theories around boundary layer turbulence in the WERF, or weather and research forecasting model, and particularly the parameterization scheme that represents boundary layer and surface layer turbulence. So a particular reason why we need to be investigating and improving upon these parameterization schemes is that even though our current existing implementation and our current theories can represent things that happen in the daytime reasonably well, they struggle in the early evening transition and representing nocturnal turbulence. So we have to incorporate new ideas and more complicated or complex relationships that account account for these complexities that go on in the real world into our parameterization schemes and once we do so validate against our observations we get in order to try to improve our forecasts in this area. The actual data or cases that I end up using in my investigations in particular come from two case sets, two important categories of real world circumstances in order to have our models represent well. The first are late fall, early winter cases over bare soil that I've looked at. And then there's another case set that's during the summertime over soybeans, over vegetation. And so looking at both of these allows us to get a good diversity of different situations of turbulence that go on in order to get a good perspective on the kinds of real world types of phenomena that we need to represent well in our models. Why it's such a big deal that these parameterization schemes or these model subcomponents, if they're just wrong by a little bit, why does that matter? But it really comes down to if they represent one thing wrong, there can be this cascading effect of air that goes on. So a big problem that you may not think initially is that big of a deal, such as runaway cooling, ends up becoming a really big deal because it represents the cooling wrong, then you get your scales of turbulence wrong. And then that mixes up what's going on in the atmosphere and then that affects your wind speed and all of your other forecast variables down the line just because your representation of boundary layer turbulence and how it represented cooling was just off. So it's really important that we get a good physical understanding of what's going on so we don't get these runaway or these cascading errors showing up in our forecast models. I'd like to thank you for joining us on this virtual tour today, and I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation for providing the support for this experiment. Of course, the, the, the staff and the, and the scientists that I've been working with have been really, really fun to work with, and I, I hope you enjoyed their uh, segments of this video as well. If you have any questions about the research we're doing, both just in general, uh, as a member of the public, or if you're a scientist who's interested in collaborating with us, please feel free to, to contact uh, the contact information provided at the end of the video. Feel free to visit our website for the Atmospheric Observatory, and just send us a note. We'd be happy Happy to hear from you and we're happy to talk with you about our work. Thank you. Okay, I'll just uh, quickly go to the uh, end of the slideshow here, uh, just for some other uh, acknowledgments. But uh, uh, you know, feel free to contact us if you'd like more information on on data. 
And uh, I'll just leave it at that with acknowledgments given the time and I'd be happy to take any questions and as well as to my team members, uh, maybe they could better answer some of those questions uh, if it's appropriate.